family, welcome to the second class in the EWA course. Um, this course is entitled EWA, a warrior's character. And our lectures are based on this book, EWA, a warrior's character, by me of course. Um, we're going to be focusing on some more rules tonight, but before we do, we want to reiterate, we want to reemphasize two very important points. Number one, we're looking at the rules that are given to us by our ancestors, and the reason why we're having this discussion in the first place is because there are character issues, serious character issues in our community both among the young and among the old, and we're not going to sit around pointing fingers because there's enough blame to go around. We are not acting like the Africans that we're supposed to be. So I'm assuming, or I have assumed in beginning this discussion, that the problem is either that we need to be reminded of these rules because we have forgotten about them even though we know them and we're not practicing them, or we're not aware of them in the first place, which means that we need to be introduced to them. So this book is an introduction to um, a variety of, not perspectives, but a variety of voices that speak to these rules, that have listed these rules in various contexts, in various social contexts, in various situations, so that Africans would be reminded as to what they are supposed to be about, about who they are. Um, but we need to also recognize that that we are at war and that all of the times that these rules were given, they were not given within the context of war. They were not given in, in the context of us having to fight for the liberation, empowerment, and sovereignty of African people. They were rules that were talking about how human beings are supposed to respond or act toward other human beings. And we talked before about whether Europeans are human beings or not, and that's not really relevant. What's relevant is that these individuals who we're dealing with were not there when these rules were given out. They were not the individuals who these rules um, were speaking to, and if we use these rules just as they are given without consideration of the people who we're talking to, then we're going to end up getting stepped all over because in this social and cultural context, anyone who responds in a reciprocal way or a kind way or a humanly meaningful way to other people is seen as a sucker. So we have to understand that these rules need to be interpreted by warriors in this cultural context. We need to understand that these rules need to be understood by warriors who are fighting against a people who is trying to destroy our people. The other part of that is that, and this is a sub to that, we need to understand cultural context. We need to understand where we are. We need to understand what this culture is about. We need to understand this culture is trying to um, destroy us. We need to understand that we are not in traditional or any other African society. This is not where we are. So we can't act like we are. We can't pretend that we are. We are not in traditional African cultural context, so we cannot act or pretend um, as if that's what's going on <coughs> here. Um, okay, also wanted to remind folks that in terms of a warrior's character, and this is very important, I hope everyone has this, The importance of character to African people, that it was, it's in, the importance of it is indicative of how early it was taught, of how much of a priority character was, or a person's character was, because we are a communal people, and a communal people need to get along with each other. That's supposed to be the basis of communality, where we 
uh, operate as one. Even though we are individuals, we still operate in the interest of each other. So we have to act accordingly. And acting in that way has to be socialized into people. That doesn't mean that the spirit or the um, NA drive to that is not there. It just means that it has to be taught, it has to be reinforced, and not just in terms of people telling you how you're <coughs> supposed to act or how you're supposed to behave, but also in terms of them setting a standard themselves, of them modeling the kind of behavior that African people are supposed to have. So there will not be a contradiction between what? What you think, what you say, and what you do. So we need to also reiterate the point that Africans, African people, taught character, let's say good character, good character first. I'll say first and last, which would imply throughout one's life. Character was the primary focus between individuals, the development of good character, maintaining of good character. So what we're talking about um, are here with these lists that we're talking about. We're talking about lists for living. Lists for living. How we're supposed to live, the kind of people we're supposed to be. Lists for living huh, adjusted to this reality and our African vision. That means that they need to be understood in the context of nation building and re-Africanization, both of which are processes. And they are ongoing processes. They do not end once we have attained liberty, political liberty from whoever, or economic liberty from whoever, educational liberty, or whatever kind of liberty. They continue forever, as has been said by so many people. Freedom is not something that you get. It's something that you have to continue to earn. It's something that you have to continue to work at. It's not something that you acquire. You say, okay, now I'm free. No, it's something that you have to maintain. It's something that you have to fight for until you um, no longer exist as a people, which presumably will be forever, okay? So, today we're going to talk about two sets of rules and make a brief statement about um, complementarity, which is, uh, of course, very important. Um, Yes, a statement about complementarity. So we're going to start out with a set of rules that Kwame Nkrumah put in a very small book. Um, called Revolutionary Handbook of Revolutionary Warfare. It's a very important book for uh, warriors, like you already said, young warriors, warriors of any age, because we often forget some people don't come into consciousness until they're in their 60s, in their 70s, in their 80s. So that means that at that point in time, they need to begin to read, to digest that material that explains to them who they are. But this right here is a book that can be read by somebody in their teens and their lower teens for that matter. Somebody who's in the seventh or eighth or, or ninth grade and probably get a good understanding. And those children who have been raised in a deeply African centered home, they're probably reading something like this in maybe the fifth grade or even the sixth grade. So this set of rules is given to us by Kwame Nkrumah, Ghana. And these are, let's say, Gorilla rules. 
guerrilla rules. And of course, guerrillas are those individuals who um, fight under the cover of night, who are guerrillas because they are fighting against a military presence that is numerically and quantitatively, well, quantitatively, that would be quantitative, qual and qualitatively, if you will, overwhelming. So they have all of the artillery or the bulk of the artillery. They have a bulk of the manpower. They have a, a, an organization. They have reinforcements coming from wherever, and they are in these people's land. Okay, I haven't heard of guerrillas that are fighting in someone else's land for their space. Guerrillas fight usually or always, I guess I would say, or almost always in their own territory. So they're trying to remove people from their yard, from their backyard. Uh, and they do it in a way where they attack and steal and attack and kill and they hit and run and hit and run and hit and run and hit and run. That's what guerrillas do. Um, guerrilla theory, especially the theory, guerrilla theory that came out in the 60s and in the 70s and in, even in the 50s, one of the main assumptions there was that these guerrillas were fighting for people who knew that they were oppressed and didn't want to be oppressed. So they supported the activities of these guerrillas. They, these were their sons, their daughters, their mothers, their fathers, their uncles. They supported their activity. They just weren't, uh, either weren't courageous enough or they didn't have the skills or they had other responsibilities because just holding a gun is the only thing that makes for a guerrilla is doing everybody who's involved in that process was also a part of the guerrilla movement. It was part of the, the national movement or the, the movement to move these aliens out of their space. Um, but it was it's assumed in this theory that these the rest of the population or the bulk of the rest of the population supported these activities. So the guerrillas would could hit and run and when they ran they would have places to run to, hide, be fed, have shelter because the population was assisting them so they would know that they could go and run. So they were working for the, for the people. They were an extension of the people. They were the arm, military arm um, of the people when the people were being severely um, oppressed and they wanted these people gone so they had the people support but we need to understand as guerrillas today whether we're talking about intellectual guerrillas however we want to define ourselves or you individually want to define yourself that's not the case today most of the people believe that this is the best possible place for them to be that their mental side is the most wonderful frame of mind to be in and that Europeans are the most beautiful people on the planet in fact they are supreme and the best model for humanity so if you do things, what have you, against Europeans, you can't run to them for assistance if you are attacked because they will turn you in. So we have to go about the business, which I have attempted to do at least slightly in this book, of redefining exactly what guerrilla theory is talking about, exactly how it is that we are defining um, this term guerrillas, because we are in a different social and different cultural um, context. Uh, when I look at these rules, uh, Kwame and Krumah's, along with uh, the rest of the rules, they should be common sense. This should not have to be things that we're talking about. They should be, they should be common sense. Uh, in our tradition, uh, evil was defined as anything that hurt people, especially needlessly. Good was defined as anything to help people. Okay, so if we are commonsensical, in terms of how we treat people, in terms of how we're treated, we're able to really come to these rules of our own accord. That which hurts should not be done. That which helps should be done. And these rules talk about those things that should be done. But I want to write um, the ones I want to talk about by Kwame Nkrumah up here. And they're not in the order. There is a number of them. I believe that there's a total of 15, so I'm only taking a few of them. Um, let me write them up here quickly.
Now, I'm really of the opinion that the last one is the most important one. Always be the servant of the people. Because that pretty much covers all of them. If you are the servant of the people, then there are things that you don't do to the people. There are things that you don't do against individuals within in the people, among the population. Because you are there to serve. Servant means to serve. And gorillas are servants. They are trying to liberate the people. They are trying to liberate space so that their people can be who they are. They're not there for themselves. They work for the people. They owe the people. The people are their employers, if you will. The first one talks about speaking politely. Um, that can be difficult for warriors at times. I know that um, it can be hard in dealing with African people sometimes who have been raised in this insanity and who use speech or a lack of it to try to exercise or, or control or to diss people or because they become so individualized that the only person that they see is themselves and they expect everyone to speak to them but they don't have to speak back or they're just used to being isolated in this reality and they don't expect people to speak, and they don't speak. That is the reality that they have accepted. That is the way that they believe things are and should be. It can be very difficult being a fighter for African people when you speak to African people and they don't speak back, and there's quite a bit of that. Um, that can be frustrating to um, warriors, but that does not take away from us knowing that we're supposed to be polite to African people that we're supposed to talk to African people with the utmost respect, that we're supposed to be nice to African people. Of course, if we are disrespected in the process, then that niceness, of course, should stop. No one, no warrior, no gorilla should allow him or herself to be disrespected by anyone. I don't care how close they are in blood. I don't care how far they are in space. Doesn't make any difference. We should not allow ourselves to be disrespected by anyone who looks like us. Period. And we, of course, should be speak politely to those who look like us. According, of course, according to Europeans who are uh, our, according to Chancellor Williams, sworn uh, enemy, and I side by him on that point. My response to them would be the same as Kamal Cambones: You don't speak. I don't have anything to say unless it is a matter of business or otherwise. Uh, the next point is return everything that you borrow. You are a servant of people. If someone is giving you something, allowing you to use something to assist you in the process of your guerrilla activities, then you need to return that in as good or better shape. It used to be common sense. He's out the way I was raised, and that wasn't that long ago. I was brought up, you treat other people's things better than you treat your own because they're not yours. And if it's possible, then you return those things to those individuals in better shape than you receive them. The, I guess a good example would be if I borrow someone's car. Well, when I return that person's car, that gas tank should be full because they allowed me to use their vehicle. It's not mine. It belongs to them. If I borrow someone's book, then I need to make sure that that book is returned to them in immaculate condition and the same assuming that it came to me in that way the best possible condition that it can be in um, we have libraries we have elders with libraries with books in them that you can't find anymore and so many of them and we'll talk about this in another class but so many of them recognize the needs of young warriors of new warriors and they say okay this person needs to read this book or this person needs to read that book and they haven't seen this so they need to digest that and they will out of the goodness of their heart pull from their library from the communal libraries because these elders don't have personal libraries they have communal libraries they will pull from their communal library and allow the warrior to read the book and either not get it back or get it back and bad condition and the warrior will look at the elder like something is wrong because they question this. As Garvey said, never lend anyone a book that you want. You'll never get it back. So we have to not, not 
uh, allow warriors to have access to this information, what we have to do is to set it up in such a way that they can have this information, but it doesn't do any damage to the community libraries that we have. So like here at Akaban, our library is open to anyone in the community who, who has our respect. But, and you can read anything that you want to in this library. The book just can't leave the house. In fact, we've had uh, young folks come and camp out in our uh, living room for multiple days doing research using books from the library. And it was agreed. They just couldn't leave. We didn't necessarily want them to stay that long, but they couldn't leave the house. I didn't mean that as an insult where you, you get like people in your house and they stay. So they could just couldn't leave the um, house with the books, but they could sit and read as long as they wanted to. That's, that's our policy, and it has worked. And with that policy, maybe one or two books have somehow ended up missing, but for the most part, the library is intact. And some of these books you can't find anywhere, or there's an extreme high probability that you will never be able to find them. And our library is very small compared to a lot of people, you know, and not as um, dense African-wise as a lot of people's um, libraries. It's a shame what happened to John Harry Clark's library in uh, the Atlanta University Center's um, library as a result of the level of disrespect. And I not know that it had a lot to do with the Negroes there who knew that John Henry Clark was disrespected by Europeans. So that trickle down disrespect, they knew they could disrespect his library because Europeans had no appreciation for his library, especially European Jews who saw him as a, as a threat and an insult. But of course, those people who they see like that, we know that we need to protect their stuff. We know that we need to treat it even better than they did. We need to treat it with kid gloves, as they used to say, because we're borrowing from this ancestor's library. This is one of those libraries that shouldn't be burnt down. Like they say when an elder dies, and a library is burnt down. This library shouldn't be burnt down. Okay. Um, next is pay for anything that you damage, which is the same as returning everything that you borrow. Um, the reason why these rules are, are, are being said, I said they should be common sense, is that often warriors, often uh, soldiers, if you will, often guerrilla fighters, they um, begin, as they, as they used to say about young folks, they begin to smell themselves. They begin to think that they're all that because they're the warriors, they're fighting for the people, they're doing, quote unquote, all of the work. So they can do damage to things or they can hurt things and just walk away and don't want to say anything because they're all that important and they're not. We keep forgetting this word, servant. That's an African concept. In the West, if you're in the military, you're not, you don't see yourself as a servant. If you're anything, you're a servant to whoever is your commanding officer or whatever the state is, but you don't see yourself as a servant to the citizens of that country. You see yourself as someone like everybody else who's out to get everything that they can. And you will use your uniform to do that. So we have to pay for anything that, that we damage. We have to make sure that we don't damage things unnecessarily. Uh, next is don't take liberties with women, which in this cultural context, particularly in the West, is probably the second most important well, the third most important on this board right here. Um, because of the uniform, because of what we do, often warriors, often soldiers, will take advantage of the sisters. Brothers will often take advantage of the sisters, and sisters will also take advantage of the brothers because of the position um, that they have or their ability to manipulate. And people will look up to these fighters because they are doing things that are courageous. They have these beautiful character qualities about them, and they um, are looked up to by people. And those who do not have a sense of decency, those who do not have an African sense of good character, will use that to get what they want from women, or will use that to get what they want from men. And that's not supposed to be an African quality. That's not what we're supposed to be about. Okay? Just like you have... Uh, some brothers in the community, and I have every right to talk about brothers being one, that's my responsibility. Uh, we have some brothers in the community who sisters will come to because the father is not there with their sons or their daughters and they want a man who they respect 
in the presence of their children to help them to rear them correctly and some of these brothers will see that as the right to have access to their bedroom and that is absolutely wrong that is absolutely un-African okay the next one which I would say is the second most important so if I had to put numbers with these in terms of importance of what's on the board I put one two three the next to last one is that always guide and protect the children that should apply anywhere and with everything you're supposed to be providing a model, a good model of what it means to be African for our children. And if you are a gorilla, then that means that part of what you're doing, that the heart of what you're doing, is the protection of the children. That's essentially what it's all about, because the children carry us forward. Which means that the children's minds and bodies should be protected. And we're supposed to provide the correct guidance. We're not supposed to provide models that turn them away from who they are. We're not supposed to begin to act like our enemies. We're supposed to act like warriors and correct the situation and do whatever is necessary to remove the enemy from our space and to create safe spaces and to maintain space, safe spaces. But that shouldn't be done at the expense of character because the children are always watching. They're always watching. And the last, of course, is always be the servant of the people. There's nothing more important, I don't think, than that. Um, that concept and if we could say that every day and understand it then we would know our particular role and everything that we think however we think about whatever it is that we're going to do then we have to think about it in terms of being in service you are doing something that helps people who maybe can't do it for themselves or have other responsibilities while you were doing this work you're here to serve. You're not here to get served. You're here to serve African people as warriors. Okay. So the next list of um, rules, and I don't think I can put all these on the board, so they're going to have to go up a little bit at a time, are given to us by a brother who wrote a very important book called The Black Student's Guide. The Black Student's Guide to Positive Education. I know our daughter read it when she was in uh, high school. Because I found the guidelines in there and the rules and the things to think about in terms of being a warrior at alien schools in particular, but also at our schools of higher diseducation in many cases. Um, these rules are very important in terms of Staying grounded, keeping them grounded. If you thought about them, keeping them grounded. So, this is Zach A. Condo. And I'll call these um, student guidelines. Or we'll call these student guidelines. And said, these are different contexts. These are different um, social contexts that we're in. But the rules apply regardless. I don't see any rule up here that shouldn't apply to a warrior in the community who's 80 years old or someone who's in a, 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 a physically a martial situation or someone who is homeschooling their child. All of these rules apply in all of these situations, all of these contexts. But these, is it all because they're common sense or they should be seen as common sense. So don't look at these as this only applies to students who are getting ready to go to college someplace. These, these are rules apply to everyone throughout the community. Okay. First one is so simple. Love yourself. Love yourself. And I put after that, forgive yourself. can't love yourself, we know you can't love anyone else. So that's a given. We have to learn how to love ourselves and stop seeking external approval. Stop seeking the validation, particularly of people who do not have our interests at heart. And in fact, especially those individuals who want to commit genocide against us. Mentocidal individuals are not going to pursue or suggest things that are going to assist a warrior to be African. 
They're trying to bring you back home to their hell so that they can be comfortable and everybody can be level on that level playing field and then they can be the norm. So they're not going to try to do things or say things to you that are going to bring you back to some African home. All right, forgive yourself because I've encountered so many warriors over the years of various ages who beat themselves up continuously for what they did before they knew they were African. Some of them did some horrific things. Some of them have done just everyday mentocidal things. They live in a day-to-day -day life as mentocidal. Some of them were upset because they taught their children to be mentocidal because that's what they knew. You can't teach people what you don't know. You can't be what you don't understand. The only question for me, for folks who sit in, sit in this category, who beat up on themselves, and I understand I beat up on myself from time to time, but for people who are angry with themselves for what they did when they didn't know, the most important measurement is what have you done since you woke up? What have you done since consciousness? How far have you progressed away from European insanity since then? Have you stopped that? And have you moved to make sure that that doesn't happen again? To me, one of the greatest indicators of, of a um, leader, if you will, who has Africans at heart, and we need to redefine that in such a way that leader, because of our African sense, leadership needs to be defined in terms of family, not in terms of individuals. But those leaders who have... Um, impressed me the most are those individuals who became so disciplined, so dedicated to uh, routing the European way out of themselves, out of individuals they knew, and out of their community uh, because they were trying to correct the damage that they had done. So the indicator is how far have you moved away and how far have you gone to assist other Africans and not be caught in that trap, to assist them in moving away from being Eurocentric or whatever centric it is. Okay? Maintain strong families. Maintain strong families is very, very important. Culture, power, sense of self, self-love gets passed on through lineage, it gets passed on from the parents to the children, from the grandparents to the parents to the children, from the grandparents to the children. It gets passed on, so we have to maintain strong families. Weak families aren't nation builders. Weak families lead to the downfall of a nation, just like strong families lead to the upliftment of a nation. So if you want to start solidly in your re-Africanization and nation building process, then you have to start building a strong family. You have to correct what's wrong with that family. You have to build. Okay? Um, next, act and dress in a dignified and respectable manner. Some of these, like I said, common sense should be self-explanatory, okay? Some people, the acting part should be more self-explanatory. Some people think that being African means that I have to have a new outfit on every day. That I have to have on this set of African clothes or clothes in the African tradition or this particular, particular attire. To me, it's more important a matter of how you keep your clothes. You might have only one dashiki. Okay? You might have only one aunt, one be. That's what you can afford. And we shouldn't be spending uh, more money than um, what our clothes should cost. This shouldn't be a major part of our budget, what our clothes look like, how many clothes we have, how many different shoes we have. It's a matter of what you do with what you have. How you look in what you have. What you have is clean or not. How are you dressed? Is it appropriate for the occasion? Okay? Okay, so we need to act and dress 
in a fashion that is respectful, that's self-respecting. And he'll say, well, how do you know that? Well, what would the ancestors think? What would the ancestors think if they were looking at you right now, at your attire, at your hair, at your jewelry, at your shoes, what have you? What would they think? Would they think that you were a clown? Or would they think that you were a warrior? Would they think that you were serious about being African and nation building? Or would they think that you are trying to make a joke of it so that it never happens? Okay, Because we can play at something until we no longer exist. Next would be learn to discipline yourself. Which I would put in the top two or three of his list. And he has a very long list. And again, the, what I'm putting on the board is sort of like reading a book versus uh, going to the movie. You go to the movie, you get little bits and pieces. You have to need to read the book in order to uh, really understand uh, or get the rules. This is the thing that's missing more out of warriors than anything else, I think. More than anything else. The absence of discipline. And discipline is something that we do to ourselves. Discipline is something that we have to work on ourselves. It doesn't come from anybody else. It requires us to focus on what we're supposed to be focused on. It requires us to stay awake for the entire time that we are here as warriors. There is no time for sleep. So discipline is very important. If you can't discipline yourself, then you can't be a decent warrior. Do not be afraid to be called radical or liberal. And liberal to me is pretty much irrelevant because in this cultural context, liberal is misdefined. And people who walk around calling themselves liberal tend not to have our interests at heart. They tend to want to include everybody in the discussion and everybody in the fight, even those who want with all their might to be anything but African, who, when we win, will work very diligently to undermine anything that is African. Because liberal within the Western context means that you are receptive to anybody's ideas. And those ideas, many of them are not African. But to be called radical, this should be the norm. To be called revolutionary among a people who are being destroyed, systematically being destroyed. Being radical and being revolutionary should be what everybody is. Because you're fighting against being destroyed. You're fighting against being oppressed. So if you are not being radical, that means that you are in some way, shape, form, or fashion allowing that to happen. Allowing that to exist. Allowing your people to be destroyed. So this is not something that we should be ashamed of. And I told a story. I don't need how many times when I was uh, teaching college of uh, one of my quote unquote colleagues, um, the students came to me running from his class one day and they said, Professor Crawford, Professor Crawford, he just called you psychotic. And I said, go back and tell him thank you. Because anyone who is a Negro who calls me psychotic, that's a compliment. That means I'm doing my work. Now, if that individual said, oh, he's doing a wonderful job, then I know something is wrong with what I'm doing. Okay. So that discipline is important. Again, emphasize that over and over again. That discipline is important. All of these things that we've been talking about so far require personal discipline to be able to deal with People not understanding what you are doing and trying to laugh at you or make fun of you because you decide that you want to be quote unquote radical or revolutionary, that requires a disciplined stand. That requires you to be able to tolerate stuff that other people cannot tolerate. That requires discipline. To be African in a world that is anti-African and to be consistent with it and to stand by it no matter what happens, that requires self-discipline. Most people quit. Most people are weak. Discipline makes you strong. Discipline strengthens you. And running from stuff or having other people do it for you weakens you. Okay. Um, respect and consult with our elders. 
We're not talking about olders here. We're talking about elders. We're talking about those individuals who have since consciousness, since awakening, have spent their lives in service to African people, have done everything in their power in every age group that they were in to assist African people re-Africanize nation build. People like Hannibal Afrique, people like John Henry Clark, people like Charcy McIntyre. Those are ancestors, but I'm looking at them within the context of the model of elders. People like Francis Crest Wilson, people like Marumba Ani, and people like Larry Obadelli Williams. We have a whole collection of elders to look up to, and everywhere we are, if we're African, we're going to find elders. We will find elders. Olders need to be dismissed. They're just simply old black folk. Old Negroes are simply old Negroes. They're still Negroes. Nothing changed there. So we have to look for those individuals whose politics reflect those of our ancestors, who have a vision of a empowered, liberated, sovereign African people. Period. Okay. So we have to show them respect. We can do that in so many ways. We know that we consult them. We need to bring our children also to their feet so our children can listen because that disconnect between the old and the young is very bad. Folks need to read Fukuyao's <coughs> Congo art of babysitting. And yes, I know it sounds weird because we understand what babysitting means in the West, but this is an extremely important, it's a very small book, but it's an extremely uh, important book that we need to read. Put this here too. It's a very thin book, but it's extremely important because it shows the African way of connecting the young and the old so that you have cultural continuity. It doesn't stop, it doesn't get cut short uh, between generations. It maintains itself. This respect is also very important. Most of us don't do things for elders. We think that opening the door for them when they're coming through the door is enough. Folks who are getting older, they begin to understand. It can get difficult to mow a lawn. It can get difficult to carry in groceries. It can get difficult to move a table from point A to point B. It can get difficult to cook this or to cook that. It can be difficult to work in the garden. It can be difficult to cut back branches when they overhang your house so that your roof begins to rot. It can be difficult to do things for your vehicle. It can be difficult to get around. So when we talk about respecting elders, that's supposed to be an act. Not just, oh, my elder and giving them all kinds of verbal praise. We have to do things for the elders that needs to be done. Things that need to be done. And most of us know the difference between wants and needs, but things that need to be done, that help them to do what they need to do, that help them to be mobile, that help them to be alive. We have to do those things for them. Just the same way we do for, for babies. And elders, of course, aren't babies, but they reach a point where they can't do these things for themselves anymore. And if we respect them like we say, then we should be doing these things. We shouldn't hear stories like we've heard about Doc Ben. We shouldn't hear what we've heard about so many of those warriors who came before us, who died in abject poverty or nobody taking care of them in some home where everybody forgot about them. That's not African. We shouldn't be doing that. Elders shouldn't have to worry about whether they're going to be eating when they turn 80 or 90 because they've been serving African people so long and didn't become Negroes and create this humongous bank account, what have you, so that they could survive somehow because they gave their all to African people. Well, when they get older, African people should be giving their all to them because they served African people and African people owe them. So that is respect and consulting. Um, next, old wisdom. I don't know any generation that hasn't heard this. Practice what you preach. It's coming out of your mouth and it should be reflected in what you do. You shouldn't be saying things or telling other people to do things that you yourself are not willing to do and are not doing. They say that's the good, that's the, the perfect sign or excellent sign of 
a military leader, someone who would not step anywhere, not send his men or women anywhere that he wouldn't go, or he wasn't at the at the lead. What, did, um, what was the African proverb? The real leader is the one who is closest to the enemy in pursuit. That's the sign of the person who is a real leader. That's the sign of the person who practices what they preach. Okay. Um, learn to defend yourself. And even though being able to do this verbally is important, he was talking about being able to physically def defend yourself. Learn some martial arts. Learn some African martial arts. Ella Balagoon has a beautiful book entitled African Martial Arts, that all the young folk and all everybody else, but particularly the young folk, particularly the members of the warrior class who think that they're all of that, they need to read. They need to study. We need to know how to defend ourselves. We need to know how to defend our families. And that's more than just being able to hit somebody. You need to know how to look when you go outside, when you step outside. You need to know when and where and how to park your car. You need to know what you're supposed to do when you step back into your house after you've been gone. You need to be able to, uh, because we are our community, all of us are one. If one person's hurt, everybody's hurt. We need to make sure that we do things um, when we are out that assist other people in the community. Like driving by someone's house who you know may not be as secure as you'd like it to be to check. Just do an eyeball spot check to make sure that everything is alright as you drive by it. Okay? Be a positive role model for African children. Now, here we go with this children thing again. All of these Africans, they just keep talking about children. I wonder why. Everywhere you go, every scholar you talk to, every warrior you talk to is worth their weight in, in, in gold or melanin, if you will. They're always talking about these children. Children, children, children. Maybe that's got something to do with who we are, our priorities. African people value children so much. That is until we become mentocidal. Okay. This is a long one, so let me start back up at the top. <clears throat> Teach our children to love and identify with African traditions and features. African traditions. And features. In fact, you could have just said, even though I understand why, you could have, should have just been able, to, you should have been just been able to say, with themselves, with their people, with who they are, with who they're supposed to be about, with what they look like, with what their people look like. Identify with, identify with. To see themselves as one with, to see themselves in that, to recognize themselves in everything that's African, to love themselves, to love themselves, to look at themselves and see something truly beautiful, and to look at other folks and not necessarily see anything that's too ugly, but to see something that is not comparable to them. To love self is not to hate others, but we are the priority. African people should by their be the priority. That we're not as evident in who we look to when we're thinking about God. Because for us, God doesn't look like us. And that's a major statement about how much we don't love ourselves and how much we do see someone else is more beautiful than us. How could that be? No one else does that.
Okay. Here we go with these children again. Make the education. Of our children. A priority. Make the education of our children. Not, not miseducation. Not diseducation. But the education <coughs> of our children a priority. Learning who they are, learning what their power is, learning about their responsibility to African people, learning who their enemies are, learning what they have to do to liberate and power and make African people sovereign. Teaching them science. Teaching them how to build, teaching them how to understand how things work. Teaching them about concepts, sovereignty, menticide, genocide, nation building, re-Africanization, lineage, asili. All these are important words for our children to understand. These are important concepts, excuse me, they're not just words, they're concepts that our children need to understand. Miseducation, not teaching them things that have nothing to do with their liberation and that really lead them nowhere. But they're walking around thinking that they're intelligent because they can repeat this or they can regurgitate that or what have you. Diseducation, teaching them that thinking is a problem, that you shouldn't want to think. That thinking is work and that's something that you don't want to do because it's too much work. Make the education of our children a priority. And let's take this last one. Identify, identify yourself first and foremost <clears throat> as an African person. This is very important. There's a sister, Yah Santiwa and Zina, whose story whose story everyone should be aware. Because this sister attempted to, not attempted, she was teaching her students in the New York school system that they are African and that was something to be proud of. And of course this upset a European, probably multiple Europeans, and a Negro. Um, and she ended up losing her job for teaching our children who they are. Same thing, uh, same scenario, if you will, with Autumn Ashanti um, in her poetry where the school system would not allow her to come in and give her poetry to the children. Thankfully, that did no damage to her and in fact, it made her even stronger. But this sister, Yasanta Wazinga, she wrote an article, an essay that's included in Ray Winbush's Should America Pay? This is a very important read for folks, but I just want to read one paragraph out of here in terms of identifying ourselves as African. <clears throat> no political boundaries. We are a people. We are a nation. This is Garvey said. We are a nation. And she said, be mindful of those teachers who insist on referring to themselves and their students as African Americans. They are generally not comfortable with being an African and will defend African-American vehemently, claiming they are both. Ironically, you seldom see the African side of these individuals. So it's something that they have to say now. That's a category that they have to fit in now. It's not that they are in any way, shape, form, or fashion uh, connected or feel connected to being African. But that is what they have to deal with now. And if the next second someone said, you are fully American, they would be celebrating. There would be tears of joy streaming out of their faces. Okay. 
So that's Zach A. Kondo's um, rules. The last thing that I want to talk about deals with complementarity. Um, and I'm not going to go through the, the steps or the correct order as I talk about them in this book and as I talk about them in the book Complementarity. But I do want to make a point because people, our ancestors understood, not only did marriage serve the purpose of uh, legitimizing, if you will, procreation, of, of providing a place where strong families could develop within the context of a larger family, within the context of a larger community, but it gave um, uh, something, it, it strengthened something that should have already been in place or was already in place among African youth. And that was the idea of, of uh, not the idea, the um, sense of, of discipline, the sense of being responsible to other people, um, a greater sense of community among individuals, of working for other people, not at your own expense, but in assisting other people, that assisted you. And one of the things, and probably the main thing that is missing from an understanding of what marriage is supposed to be about, is that it disciplines. And I think I'll put it like this on the board. 